Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Um, it is one minute past 5 p.m. Greetings from London and the Centre for Grand Strategy at King's College London. Um, my name is Alessio Pathlano, um, and I am absolutely delighted today uh, to welcome you to the second uh, part of a, a three segment series that the Centre has been doing, trying to explore one year on how the integrated review um, that was published last year, the main uh, 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 guiding documents for British foreign um, and security policy um, is holding up against uh, uh, what is a fast evolving international security landscape. Um, in the last episode, we talked about the basic principles and first orders ideas about continental maritime strategy. Today, we're taking this conversation at the very heart of uh, how usually big ideas are tested or don't tend to withstand the reality of events as they unfold. And I couldn't be uh, 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 luckier today to host an absolutely stellar panel uh, for the conversation we're going to have. The main the uh, theme of our conversation is certainly the integrated review, but the integrated review in light of the past few months of the uh, what started as a major crisis and then evolved into an invasion and now a war um, in Eastern Europe, in Ukraine, waged by Russia. Um, the panelists today, and I will introduce them um, in the order they will be speaking, are Dr. Louise Kettle, um, Air Marshal Edward Stringer, and Dr. Natasha Kurt. Now, um, starting with Louise uh, Kettle, um, she joins us um, uh, today. She's an associate professor um, and she works um, on uh, key matters uh, related to uh, British uh, foreign security policy. Um, she's also um, a, a historian, um, a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. Um, and she brings her wealth of expertise to this conversation. Air Marshal uh, Stringer, retired from the Royal Air Force uh, as um, uh, uh, after a number of uh, posts. Um, he served both in, in both First and Second Gulf War. He was involved into war in Afghanistan and in his last post had a chance to reflect upon his own past experience as he was overlooking um, the sort of overarching um, uh, 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 defense education establishment uh, in the British military. Last but no means least, uh, Dr. Natasha Kurt um, is a colleague here at the Department of War Studies and the lecturer in um, international peace and security, a Russian specialist uh, at heart, and certainly someone who's been following these events concerning Russian uh, behavior over the past few months very closely. So um, all the speakers will all have about 10 uh, minutes to have some opening remarks to set the stage. And then the back of that, um, we will proceed with um, a broader conversation. Um, a couple of, um, of, of general sort of um, uh, points, um, just in terms of the logistics of how we're going to proceed. Um, if you're asking questions, you have um, traditional ways you can use the chats, or, or indeed you can use the Q&A space dedicated on Zoom. Um, after the first sort of few minutes, you can start typing your questions, your comments, and I will make sure to bring to the panelists' attention. Um, I should also sort of note that the event is currently recorded, um, so you should be aware of that as you provide your thoughts and contribution to our proceedings. So without any further ado, I leave the floor to Louise. Louise, welcome and thank you very much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for having me and thank you very much to everyone uh, joining today. I, I'm going to start um, by focusing on specifically on the integrated um, review, which I know Professor pa uh, Patelano uh, mentioned, but very much the integrated review rather than the defense command paper that came out of it, which I believe uh, Air Marshal Stringer will um, focus on. So this is more about the kind of strategic direction for Britain moving forward up to 2030 rather than the kind of defense implementation side of things. Now, overall, I think the integrated review has held up pretty well, actually, in, in light of the Ukraine crisis. Writing these things are always tricky, kind of trying to foretell the future, um, some prediction required, 
And I think it is just the law of, of these kind of things that as soon as they're written, some sort of uh, international crisis happens, which brings them all into question. However, <clears throat> what I would say is, I think it's held up pretty well in, in three, three key ways. Um, the first is that it made it very clear that in the run up to 2030, we were gonna see a real change in the nature and distribution of global power. Um, and from the integrated reviews perspective, they argued that this was gonna be a move away from terrorism and insurgency as the key threats, and instead moving to watch more towards state-based threats focused on kind of systemic competition between states due to geopolitical and, and geoeconomic shifts. And in determination of international rules and norms. And I think that we will review the Ukraine crisis in light of this sort of shift. Um, and it, it fits very um, kind of neatly within, within that prediction. The second the key thing that the integrated review emphasized that was that whilst China was definitely identified as Britain's most systemic um, competitor, that Russia was identified as its most acute threat. And um, this was very clear throughout. There are a number of other countries who are identified as threats, North Korea, Iran, but fundamentally, um, it, it, has, it was seen that Russia was the most acute and um, prevalent and um, immediate threat to Great, to Great Britain's um, security. And clearly that has proven to be the case. The third way in that I think it, it's held up well is that um, it, it stated that the UK is not gonna be able to achieve too much on its own. Uh, the emphasis was very much on alliances, continuing to support um, Five Eyes as the kind of primary intelligence alliance, of course, a focus on NATO, which I'm sure we'll discuss quite a lot. The relationship with the United States, which um, given the kind of Biden-Johnson relationship, we weren't quite sure how that was going to pan out. Um, but again, I'll come back to that a bit more in a minute. And... Um, the relationship with Europe. So the EU and um, Europe were, were very small footnotes in the integrated review, but they were in there. And there was a discussion about rebuilding the relationship with Europe. And this has definitely panned out. Actually, the Ukraine crisis, I think, has probably um, helped in this way, because even as we are seeing difficulties over Northern Ireland at the moment. Brexit really, really has been overshadowed um, by the fences being mended in order to try and get a, a, a positive um, response to the Ukraine crisis and united response to the Ukraine crisis. So I think the next question I sort of wanted to ask was how has the integrated review guided the UK response to Ukraine? And the honest answer is I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> because um, I'm not sure how much these documents really do sort of act as kind of guiding principles, especially to politicians, um, maybe more so to civil servants, but especially to politicians. But what I do know is that there is some alignment, whether this is by fortune, uh, one, one cannot tell, but there's alignment in, I think, four ways. The first has been this strong emphasis and focus on alliances and partnerships especially with the US. United States has really kind of stepped up after a pretty disastrous um, withdrawal from Afghanistan in supporting uh, its European partners in Ukraine. Um, in addition, it's clearly brought the importance of NATO to the fore. First of all, it's demonstrated that some countries see the kind of threat perception of NATO. Um, and, and it works more as a threat perception rather than a deterrent for some. However, it has clearly brought the issue of NATO and NATO security right to the forefront of security agenda. And while it's always been important, um, the debates about it, I think, are much more prevalent. And, and of course, we see um, attempts for NATO expansion with Sweden and Finland. 
Um, and as I say, there's this kind of focus on partnership with Europe as well. The second way that I think the integrated view has, has really aligned with the UK response to the crisis is that it called for um, a renewed sense of leadership in the world. And whatever people may think about Prime Minister Johnson, he has taken a lead in the Ukraine crisis. He's been well liked by Ukrainians <clears throat> and certainly compared to some other European leaders who have perhaps been more hesitant. I'm thinking of, of course, Macron or Schultz. He has seen to be a driving force in terms of rapid deployment of troops, of equipment, of pledging weaponry and aid, um, of going, even physically going to Ukraine and, and showing a presence and support um, to Zelensky. And also the UK are continuing to show leadership through the joint expeditionary force. It's more flexible coalition and force. The third way that the uh, integrated review, I think, has aligned with the response is this it's reiteration of the importance of reconnaissance and intelligence sharing, which we know has been so, so vital um, in the Ukrainian um, uh, fighting of uh, Russian troops. And then the final way is about having a stake in shaping the new world order. A big part of the integrated review or a big ambition that was identified was that the UK should be a force for good, supporting open societies and defending human rights. I'm quoting that directly there. And there was a shift in the way that this was thought about from defending a new world order to actually reshaping it, to understanding that it is changing, but that the UK wants to play an active part in, in shaping what that becomes. Now, this is going to be a question, of course, moving forward. What will this new world order be? Um, and does the integrated review need to respond to this new world order? And part of that we'll have to see as uh, the Ukraine crisis continues to play out. Um, but there are some things to consider. Um, the first is that Russia is now weaker. Its military strength is reduced due to losses uh, in Ukraine, uh, to sanctions on equipment, to its reducing economic capability. Its diplomatic strength is reduced due to the fact that some that countries do not necessarily want to um, be placed in a position of having to align one side or the other, that he's having, that's having to call in a number of favors now with, um, um, Previous allies, you know, Chechia, Syria, Iran, even um, China, and its economic strength is reduced as well through sanctions, and even the crackdowns on kind of Russian investment and organized crime. So in a number of ways, Russia is now weaker, and that must impact Britain's kind of strategic approach and response, considering that it was always considered its primary threat. The second is that continental Europe is also now more focused on its defense and security. Uh, we see increasing defense actors against Russia and there's gonna kind of be, be competing influence in this space. So we think about Germany now kind of upping its defense spend, We're talking, I think it's about $113 billion, something like that. Um, a lot of NATO nations upping their defense spending, think about Denmark, even kind of Poland's going up, Romania's going up. Um, all the defense spending is going up. Um, and there's a question about what that means then for the UK in terms of what will the UK's role be? How will this continue to reduce the Russian threat? And what will this mean in terms of continental Europe being able to have greater defense for itself and the UK therefore perhaps managing to achieve more of what it aims to in terms of its pivot to Asia. The third is the impact on China and the kind of broader anti-Western bloc. And I think this is the next big thing that needs to be thought about in terms of reconsidering the integrated review. Now I'm not an expert on China, so I'm not gonna to pretend to be, but 
clearly there has been an impact from the Ukrainian crisis, uh, both in terms of losing a kind of strong ally for, for China, they've now got a fairly weak ally in Russia. The, the pitfalls of military operations have been um, revealed, and I'm thinking here in terms of any ideas that China may have in terms of confrontation over Taiwan. And there's been an, a, um, a, a reconsideration about how much tolerance of autocracy there should be. On the flip side of that, uh, China no longer has to be worried about a kind of strong neighbor along its borders. It may be richer from uh, Russian economic reliance on it. But all of these things mean that clearly a review is needed about what is going to be China's place in this new world order and how can the UK um, think about that, considering it is supposed to be its um, biggest systemic competitor. And the final one, which is very short, um, because I am aware of my time, is um, the failure of deterrence. So this was a core part of the integrated review strategic framework and the NATO deterrence um, or in Ukraine has clearly failed and there needs to be some consideration about what this means and what this should mean for British, Britain's de uh, deterrent strategy moving forward. And I'll end it there. Wonderful, Louise. Thank you very much for thinking through um, uh, quite a lot of, of, of ground. There were so many points that you raised. Um, to me, there were two sort of uh, uh, strands that really sort of um, came out quite strongly. Going back to the very beginning of your observations when you placed the integrated review and sort of like the, how the international order is going to look like in 10, 15 years down, down the road. And, and obviously, Russia, the acute military threats, China, the systemic competitor. One of the key messages that I uh, hear you telling us is really, um, the idea and the assessment behind it was certainly correct, but the war is changing that in the sense that yes, Russia remains uh, an acute military uh, problem, but a much weaker one. And that in turn has an impact on how we understand the idea of China as a systemic competitor. Is, 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 it, is it gonna be a China that is gonna take more advantage of Russia? Is it gonna be China that's gonna be twice about going a certain sort of assertive and competitive type of path as we've seen because of Russia? Regardless of how we come to a conclusion, that's one of the sort of like um, the, the two very core points to think about as we move forwards. Um, thank you. This was absolutely brilliant. Um, and again, um, anyone that wants to start sort of um, uh, putting questions down or comments, please do so. The chat and the question um, and answer spaces are open. But now, how does it all stack up with the command paper? Air Marshal? Tell us all about it. The floor is yours. That's Pashlana, thank you very much. Um, may I just uh, add to your very kind intro by saying that actually running the Defence Academy was about a quarter of the responsibilities of my last job. And I only say that because the other bits were about imagining the future of warfare and therefore one ended up contributing quite a lot to the integrated review. And I'd hate any listeners to go away saying, hold on, he never told us that. He would say that, wouldn't he? The Mandy Rice Davies defence would apply. Um, let's look at some numbers based on what's just been said. Um, Ukraine defence, but these are very rough, uh, wrong figures because you currencies. Uh, Ukraine defence budget, roughly four, million, 4 billion a year. UK's, so that's one tenth of the UK's at 40 billion a year. Uh, Euro NATO's was, and as we've just heard uh, going up, was about 400 billion a year. So it's 1% of that. And if you look at the whole NATO spend with America thrown in, it's $1.2 trillion. So given that what we've now seen is all of Russia's combat power is pretty much tied up in trying to take one sixth of Ukraine, if you put that to an actuary, the actuary might say you're probably overinsured. So with all the other bits and pieces that the integrated review mentioned, which are genuinely you know, existential when you look at things like climate change and coming out of the fourth and fifth industrial revolutions, given what China is clearly setting out to do, then actually my, my note is an optimistic one, which is if we spend that money much more wisely, there is probably enough to address the challenges. So let's unpick some of, uh, so, some of those elements. Um, I'm not actually going to talk massively about the command paper because I don't like it very much. Um, and I, I think a criticism of it is um, that it didn't really take the integrated review and say, even though it tries to use these words, this is what it means for defense. 
what it did is it sort of rehashed all of the integrated review in slightly different language. And what it really needed to do is say, so this is what this means for defence, and these are now the hard choices. And just to make sure I wasn't suffering from false memory syndrome, I reread it again just before com coming on here. And it says that there's a lot of we're going to do more of this and more of that and more of the other. And you yeah, well, okay, so you've got to be, but you're reducing numbers in all sorts of other areas, and none of these silos are tied off. So it's a lot of nice phrases with which no one could disagree, but it doesn't go the next step. And especially given those numbers I've just spoken about, you'd think a ruthless attempt to spend such a large defence budget and spend it a little bit better would, you know, was uh, perhaps an opportunity missed. However, the question you posed to me was, you know, how much did it provide a, hand, a handrail for the Ukrainian operation? And I'm going to, therefore, for those reasons, merge the thinking of the integrated review and the uh, command paper. Actually, they were followed, but they have been followed for a while. So one of the things not really identified is what's persistent engagement and you know, a bit of insider knowledge. I know the integrated review team repeatedly asked the MOD to define persistent engagement and never really got an answer. And I know some of the suggestions are actually not, not, not far off. So, you know, a, a persistent or pulsed engagement. Well, actually, that's good because people can rely on you and, and the Brits do have a habit of taking a big interest in someone and then ignoring them for a decade. Um, it's what our uh, Asian allies used to re regularly complain about. So Orbital, for example, Op Orbital, which in the previous previous life I set up in 2015, was for seven years persistently training at the cost of only the salaries of about 100 troops training Ukrainians. I think it's one of the most cost effective operations the Brits have ever mounted, given along with our major allies, back to that idea that Louise mentioned about alliances, clearly has had a very beneficial effect um, on allowing the Ukrainians, and they have done this themselves, to think through how they de develop their modern military from the same post-Soviet routes as the Russian forces they're now up against. Some commentators have derided the IR and the command paper but for mentioning cyber and space, claiming um, that, look, tanks are back. Well, they're not saying that quite so much now. When you look at how many, how many tanks Russia's lost for not a great deal of ground taken through great manoeuvrist armoured warfare. Meanwhile, on space, uh, we know, we won't know all of it, the Ukrainians are linking themselves very effectively using Elon Musk's Starlink, which is exactly the sort of civ mill collaboration generating multi-domain um, uh, combat capabilities and having to use what are increasingly going to be um, private sector or civilian produced uh, capacities. Louise has already mentioned intelligence. I think we're seeing the benefit of that. And I should think almost every other nation in the world would like to be a member of the Five Eyes Club uh, if it could. And certainly every operation I've been involved in in my 39 military career, every country that wasn't in the Five Eyes tried to get into it using the, uh, the reasoning that the war had now started. And, and by and large, you know, they, 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 you know, they were um, allowed in. And it then talks about uh, uh, transformation. And I don't think we've got time to do that today, but the debate has already started, hasn't it? Have drones and long range precise fires and cheap but very effective lightweight anti-tank mitt, has that fundamentally transformed the battlefield? It's a question that needs answering. The second point you mentioned was, um, was to say, and what was the perception of Russia as a threat? It's been quite interesting to me how we've gone from coin to China with a very brief intervening period of Russia. Uh, though actually, Russia was always much more serious. I mean, the air defense forces of the UK, for example, which I commanded in 2007 when the Russians started uh, flying their long range aviation around our shores again and, and did it really quite professionally. Well, those people never lost sight of the fact that Russia was the threat. Our submarine service never lost sight of the fact that Russia was the threat. So the deep state had always known that Russia was the threat. And indeed, government came around to admitting that in October 16. I remember Tim Barrow chairing a Cobra meeting where suddenly you know, this, all, uh, this all came out. And then China. So I think if I go back to the integrated uh, review, actually, I think John Bue's team did really quite well, considering the politics of the administration for which they were working. They did get the EU in. They pointed out that NATO and the EU are the twin bedrocks of European security, you know, which I think is absolutely right. And they identified Russia as the acute military threat. And it's there. It, it might be a simple statement, but it's pretty stark. And perhaps if there weren't so many distracting, silly glosses and diagrams in both documents, we'd be able to concentrate more on the text and, uh, and exactly um, what it said. So I think um, 
the deep state of the military had always seen Russia as the pacing threat and was only you know, was getting around to thinking about what, what China meant. And, and has the IR been followed? Well, of course, yes, well, we're concentrating on Ukraine. What else has happened or happened just before AUKUS, which is an excellent example of cooperation that doesn't require huge forward presence of troops at great expense, but has already shifted the strategic balance in the Indo-Pacific uh, region. And, and it will extend more because if you read the small print, it's about space and cyber and AI, and all the things actually that go into making the overall systemic capability of a nuclear submarine force. So we are seeing the tenets of the IR and the command paper, not just in Ukraine, but also in that wider engagement in what is, I think we all, you know, we can all see that the rise of China is a once in 500 years episode. Discuss, I know that's a silly, you know, discuss is what you add as a bogus academic, uh, but I know you haven't asked, asked us to come on and discuss that, but I think it's quite easy um, to make that case. And the final point, I, I will try and be brief, I know you want to get to questions, kind of military that Britain needs. Well, what I like about the IR is it is, it is boldly state, stated really to anybody really reads it closely. There is a difference between war and warfare. And I have thought for a long time, the trouble with the British military is that over fetishizes warfare as if war between states is nothing but the competition between champions on the battlefield, a bit like medieval jousting. And in fact, what we're seeing in Ukraine is it's the ability to mobilize the whole of the nation state and your alliances, a point Louise mentioned. And, the, and, and uh, I, you know, I, think, I think that is absolutely right. So within those alliances, what is the sort of military that Britain needs? Will it be sensible to reinvest in armoured forces that are kept on Salisbury Plain and we'll, we'll get to the fight just too late? Or should we leave that to the continental powers? Do those hard choices mean that we should be looking at um, maritime capacity, especially as defending the North Atlantic, the sea locks, and all the bits and pieces that go with the responsibilities of this, of this island nation? Is, is, that a better, is that a more sensible spend of our defence budget within the alliance construct stockpiles i mentioned him already but you know very brilliant uh, chiefs of defense staff with depths like sir stuart peach always used to talk about stockpiles essentially saying there's no point in affording the sexiest rifle that you can manage if you can't afford to have a magazine for it and i think what we've seen now is what we always forget stockpiles run out really quickly so the problem now is not so much getting some of the fighting equipment to the Ukrainians, it's are there enough factories in the world that make 155 and 152 ammunition? These are the real world questions you want to talk about defence seriously. And they're the sort of questions that very serious countries like Finland have always asked themselves and have provided really quite, quite sensible answers. So if I may leap about a bit here, and I should have mentioned this earlier, Finland and Sweden coming into NATO is just brilliant, not least because of the conceptual component that they bring with them, which they have been... Uh, using inside the Jeff, I had the good fortune to sort of be the officer in charge of the Jeff for a couple of years and deliberately put Sweden and Finland in charge of some of our operating working groups because I thought they had the best conceptual uh, com uh, component. So final, just a few final thoughts. Um, we talk about the integrated force. Can you build it within the Levine model? I'm not sure. Uh, and so for all those academics watching, everyone pulls apart defense policy, qua policy, um, very few people in think tank world actually go and look at the machinery of government and ask in this context, can the structures around and within the MOD deliver the ambition of the integrated review, the command paper and the integrated operating concept? And are the structures optimized to do it? Spoiler alert, I think no, they're not. Um, and then the, the, the I will, I will to, to, to provoke debate, could I put a, sorry, Liz, but quite counter the deterrence failed and say, deterrence, yes, fail for Ukraine, but deterrence has absolutely worked for NATO. And our problem is leaving Ukraine lingering since 2008, half in and half out, um, which is obviously what the Swedes and the Finns uh, you know, have concluded. Um, so if you were in NATO, you, uh, deterrence work for you if you were just over the border tough and so there are some questions about what it is we're trying to deter and is it just um, looking after those within the collective alliance under article 5 which I think is a very important sort of geopolitical question it, it arises over Taiwan for example uh, I'll shut up there and um, leave the floor to our final distinguished panelist Air Marshal thank you so much um, I have to say 
it was the opening was was brilliant because you are absolutely right. And when you start putting the numbers together, rough as they are, the first question really is: Are we overinsuring ourselves? And 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 you articulated a very good answer, but it's not a question about overinsuring; it's about how you invest that money. Um, and and there. I really sort of very much enjoyed your call to draw a distinction between warfare and war, because war is about strategy, it's about placing the conduct of operations and, 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 and the tactical behavior into that broader picture. That includes also the D minus space, you know, what happens before war starts and how you shape the environment to push down that sort of down the road to that, that, that occurrence um, in a different place. Um, and, and, and within that context, um, you talk very eloquently about the question of the integrated review putting the right emphasis on alliances um, and, and, and sort of really re-engineering the debate over um, Britain's asymmetry uh, and strategic asymmetry as an actor in European security. Is it about uh, the British Army on the Rhine or is it perhaps about something else? And you mentioned there that maritime dimension, which of course brings in uh, in many respects space, cyber and all the other new domains. And the other point you mentioned about stockpiling um, so very important and not just about sort of getting the gear, um, uh, but also getting the sort of all the trimmings that are necessary. One debate, for example, about the maritime capacity um, uh, for, for the UK that you mentioned there is can the British shipbuilding industry, the broader sector, support if one wanted to have that, that, that ambition? And that's a very big question. So from that international order space that Louise so well sort of um, picked for us, we went into this question of finding a balance between strategic issues and, and, and operational issues. That leads to the question of where does this sort of take us in the conversation insofar as Russia's behavior is concerned? Natasha, come in. Join us this conversation, the floor is yours. Thank you, um, and thanks to, um, to Louise um, and Air Marshal Stringer um, for their um, really good, uh, helpful remarks. Um, so um, on the integrated review, um, when I first looked at it, um, it, it was um, surprising to me that um, there was no real discussion about collaboration between Russia and China. Perhaps that's just because um, that's an issue that I work on. So I'm kind of always on the lookout. Um, obviously, the integrated review, as already been mentioned, did single out um, Russia as an acute threat, um, while China is, in a way, almost on a sort of slightly different level. Um, described as a systemic competitor. So this was actually very similar in tone, I think, to the US um, uh, security strategy as well. Um, but, um, and I think, you know, the IR did do a very good job in a way of, um, you know, the way that it um, did talk about this, um, you know, need to really keep tabs on Russia. Um, and I think it also pointed to the fact that um, that China um, is such a difficult power with which to deal, if you like. Um, and I think we can see that in the way that, for example, I was just reading today um, a discussion in the world today, the Chatham House Journal, um, a discussion um, amongst experts on NATO. And, you know, there's this whole um, problem of, you know, where does China fit into our thinking now? Because in a way, we've kind of not really um, factored China in, you know, to the sense, as I said, of, you know, Russia and China working together. Um, you know, China's tended to be, you know, in Asia, Russia is sort of, if you like, a threat in Europe. Um, but as they are increasingly collaborating, I think we do have to, to think much more about how they work together, which doesn't mean that they are, um, you know, these kind of omnipotent powers, of course, um, and they can't be everywhere at once. But at the same time, I think we do have to get away from, as somebody put it, the idea that NATO just does Russia, if you like. Um, I know that NATO has belatedly um, acknowledged, um, you know, the need to, to sort of address, um, you know, the China problem, if you like, in terms of security. But also, I think we have been slow in acknowledging um, the kind of synergy, if you like, of Russia and China. And that's not to say that we can necessarily drive a wedge between the two. I think that's, um, 
really um, a misguided idea. Um, but um, I think that we haven't looked closely enough at that partnership um, and the ways in which it can uh, make it more difficult for, for us to operate um, in many ways. Um, I think what the IR um, has done is um, to rightly recognize the fragmented nature of the international order. Um, it hasn't necessarily got a solution for, for that, um, but it has very well recognized that fragmented nature. Um, and in that sense, I would suggest that it's talking in a way not so much about alliances, but as we've heard about the Jeff and AUKUS and so on. And in a way, these are not alliances anymore, but these are more, you know, these partnerships, these very necessary, flexible strategic partnerships. Um, and it's interesting to note that Russia and China, of course, keep denying that they are in an alliance and they also refer to, to their um, alignment, whatever you want to call it, as a flexible strategic partnership. Um, and so, um, but, you know, I do think that these kinds of partnerships like, like the Jeff and AUKUS and so on um, are very difficult for, uh, for these kind of, if you like, traditional great powers like Russia and China um, um, to deal with. And, um, you know, Russia has in a way been also getting very hot under the collar um, about, about these partnerships, even though we might think that, you know, Russia um, doesn't really um, have uh, much skin in the game, let's say, in the Indo-Pacific, for example, but it has um, increasingly been supporting China um, with joint bomber patrols and so on in that region. And so in a way, we are also being kept on our toes um, by this partnership, um, you know, in the sense that, you know, it's no longer just, you know, Russia, China and Central Asia, for example, um, you know, they're, they're also um, kind of... Uh, they're also operating, if you like, um, perhaps not actually operating, but they're also sort of, you know, providing, if you like, certain demonstrations um, of power, which may be just about signaling, but I think that's certainly something um, that we do need to keep an eye on. Um, I think what this war has shown, um, and this is, of course, a war that's been going on since 2014, uh, let's just remind ourselves it's not just happened. Um, and, you know, we could, I don't want to get into a conversation now about, you know, what should have been done back then. Um, but I think what this war has shown is that although Russia is certainly, you know, not um, showing itself to be quite the military power that we thought it was, um, at the same time, it can still inflict a huge amount of destruction, as it has done in Chechnya and Syria. Um, and also, I would say um, that although China is, you know, taking this stance of studied neutrality, as some people have called it, um, at the same time, China has been a kind of um, sort of security blanket for Russia in other ways. Um, it's provided it with a kind of cushion, strategic cushion. Um, it also, you know, there are things that happen under the radar in terms of, you know, oil shipments and so on. Um, you know, this won't be enough to buoy up the Russian economy, but it kind of, you know, means that Russia doesn't actually, isn't actually completely isolated. Um, and there are other um, countries as well, which I think are, are also quite ambivalent um, about Russia's behavior. And I think we shouldn't lose sight of that. Um, you know, there's also Turkey, which is a very interesting case because I wouldn't call Turkey certainly an ally of Russia. Um, but Turkey has its own interests in certain areas of the former Soviet Union, for example, um, you know, in the South Caucasus. Um, and so, you know, Tur and Turkey um, still kind of needs Russia in some senses. Um, I think Turkey is an interesting, is an interesting case because it still kind of needs those institutions like NATO and so on. Um, and yet, and you know, these are of some value to Turkey. Um, but at the same time, if we come back to, um, you know, the fragmented nature of the international order, which was noted in the integrated review, and also then the intensifying competition over interests, norms, and values, um, I don't think that Turkey necessarily um, kind of, if you like, upholds the norms that are produced by NATO, but it still values NATO. In, terms of security and so on. And I think that's 
we could also look at the EU, of course, and then, you know, look at countries like Hungary, which need the EU, but they don't necessarily, um, you know, subscribe to the norms and values, to all of the norms and values uh, produced by the EU. Um, so I think this, the way in which um, the IR identified this kind of fragmented nature of the international order was really, um, really correct, if you like, um, and really accurate. Um, and um, yeah, so I think it's, and again, um, the integrated review, I think has problems as we all do with China in the sense of, you know, it talks about having a positive relationship with China, including deeper trade links, more Chinese investment in the UK, but at the same time, ensuring our national security and values are protected. And I think it's becoming increasingly difficult to, to keep those things separate. Um, and um, it's become clear that China is not abandoning Russia as a partner. Um, and the UK tilt to the Indo-Pacific um, maybe suggests that the UK could play a role in containing China. Um, so, um, but in a way, the IR seems somehow strangely, seems to me to be strangely sanguine about China, if you like. Okay, it calls it systemic competitor, but you know, clearly, I mean, of course, we do need China in a way as a partner on climate change and so on as well. Um, but I felt personally as if, um, you know, there wasn't really um, a way in which, um, you know, this kind of disconnect, if you like, was acknowledged. Um, so, um, so summing up, I would say, um, you know, the IR um, really did did well to recognize the fragmented nature of the international order. It was probably better at, you know, describing the problems that we that we faced um, than it was in prescribing solutions. Um, obviously, this is before the Ukraine war. Um, you know, it also, of course, in the IR says we will uphold international rules and norms and hold Russia to account for breaches of these. Um, well, so far we've seen that the UK is prepared to um, to offer, um, you know, Ukraine advanced weaponry and so on and so forth. I suppose the question is then, and to build up the capacity of Ukrainian armed forces and so on. The question is then, for how long? You know, how long can we sustain this? And there already um, there's already concern, I think, in Ukraine that you know the West will tire, if you like, of um, of providing this support, um, you know, we could be in there for a long haul because while the Russian army may be weakened, um, it doesn't mean that it can't continue, um, you know, with this sort of war of attrition for quite some time to come, um, especially as um, Russia doesn't uh, really value um, its people. Um, so, you know, it will let its people take the hit, if you like, because that's the way, you know, that um, that the Russian state, the Soviet state before it as well, um, has tended to operate in a kind of, um, in terms of sort of political culture, if you like. Um, so, um, so overall, I think the integrated review, um, you know, did a good job of highlighting the problems, um, you know, inherent in uh in trying to to you know tackle the threats faced by russia uh, that russia uh that russia um presents um i think it was less good perhaps um in terms of identifying how to deal with china and it also didn't really um to my surprise if you like um discuss how to deal with um, a kind of growing Russia-China partnership. You know, as, we, as we've noted already, um, that partnership may um, be fraying as a result of the war, um, but um, China may also um, draw closer to Russia. Um, you know, they've already drawn closer to each other um, in terms of, you know, their sort of domestic authoritarian um, systems um, in terms of their opposition to Western hegemonism and so on. So we can't necessarily assume that China will just, you know, drop Russia. And I'll finish there.
Wonderful, Natasha. Thank you so much. Again, so much coming out of your remarks. Um, I, I thought one of the things that really struck me uh, that came out strongly was this idea of, of, of an international order that was correctly captured in integrated review as very fragmented. And that fragmentation cuts both ways. It's not just about um, you know, the authoritarian side and how it's sort of like uh, undermining and, and if you want sort of like uh, working to, 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 to slowly dismantle the existing international order. It's also how when we talk about values, um, there is an element of, of division, if not fragmentation, certainly within the EU, within the NATO, within the sort of frameworks and constructs that deliver at the way the international order operates and certainly the way it is described in the integrated review. And within that context, um, and, and you raise this very important point about the partnership between Russia and China, a partnership that currently is being tested by the events in Ukraine, but certainly a partnership that um, raises a number of questions about where it could go. And it's not necessarily a negative side in terms of like weakening that relationship. Certainly the joint statement of the 4th of February would suggest that the Chinese were conscious of the fact that, that this conflict might not necessarily go all too well for Russia and wanted to have a safety blanket against which sort of come claiming in and cashing in their chips, um, as it were, of a weakened uh, Russia. Now, we've got a lot of questions coming in already, uh, and, and I'm, I'm pretty sure we're going to have a fantastic conversation. Um, within that context, I will only partly abuse my powers as chair, uh, in the sense that um, I'll try to sort of ask a question that are coming up in the, in the chat that I also wanted to ask, and I'll, I'll go in order. Um, starting with Louise, you mentioned about uh, the, the failure of, of deterrence and NATO's deterrence. Um, I've got at least a couple of questions that wanted to ask you how to articulate that. Air Marshal Stringer himself also sort of um, uh, submitted a, a, a different view about that. So the question is, how would you categorize? Why, from your point of view, um, you'd say that the tel deterrence uh, uh, has failed insofar as NATO is concerned. I have a question then for Air Marshal Stringer because I couldn't agree more with you. I mean, what we're talking about, how do we implement the integrated review and do we have the tools? Do we, is the machinery of state up to the task? And, and you made the very, um, a very good point about if, if one looks at MOD, if one looks at the main building, do they have the capacity to sort of implement the kind of things that we are hoping to do? Eh, maybe not so much. Um, and so in that sense, is it a question of tools that we don't have or tools that we're not using properly? And is it about, you know, is it about the tools for the mechanical implementation? So for example, the right to defense procurement, or is it a structural governance type of, 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 of problem that we have? So for example, we have a national security council that perhaps is not used in the best possible way. So if you were king for one day, what it is the sort of things that you would prioritize, focus on to get that machinery of, 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 of state in the right shape? And the last question is, is for Natasha, and again, builds on some of the points that have been raised in the, in the question um, uh, and answer space. Um, obviously, you talked about the partnership. We talked about this before about Russia and China. My question for you is, is, is honestly, is pretty clear. My feeling is often that we look at Russia-China relationship and, and, and the partnership. I like very much when people use, talk about partnership and non-alliance because conceptually, I think, is the wrong pair of lenses. But we tend to judge the quality of that partnership against our own measurements and metrics. And I often hear the, the criticism raised to me also that, well, but you know, uh, Russia and, and China do not have a joint operational command structure. They don't have the sort of, um, you know, the sort of machinery in place that we do when we think about NATO, when we think about, you know, Five Eyes or, or bilateral ties with the US and so on and so forth. Do you think that is um, part of our mistake? Is that a little bit delusional to try to continue to force our own way of thinking and on, on, on other partnership to get a sense of whether they're good or not to begin with? And related to this, um, do they actually need to get something like the sort of, you know, uh, uh, partnerships and, and structures that we have to be effective? Because from all I've seen, you know, 
you can do stuff in many different ways. Do they need to have the sort of NATO-like posturing to be looked at and regarded as, as potentially effective in what they wish to achieve? And I'm not necessarily sure about the, the answer to that question. But again, I, I would really love to have your insights on this. So whilst I think I gave Louise enough time to gather her thoughts. Louise, do you want to come back in? Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, so on this this question, the failure of deterrence. So I think I think there's um, one ways in which it's failed, and two ways two ways in which it succeeded. Um, the way that it's failed, and, and I guess how I was referring to it is that NATO and the EU saw many ways, many means to try and dissuade Russian uh, Russia from using force against Ukraine. And ultimately that failed. So clearly there needs to be a rethink about what kind of ways and means of deterrence are being used and why did that not succeed in this particular event? Um, how has it been successful? Um, well, Air Marshal uh, Stringer talked about one of these. One is in fact, it is it has ensured the, um, the limits of the war both in terms of um, limiting the war to Ukraine, the territory of Ukraine itself, not expanding outside, not going close to actual NATO members. And we hope in terms of limiting the war in terms of non-use of nuclear weapons. Now, there, there are obviously other political and geostrategic reasons why Russia may not use um, nuclear weapons, um, as well as kind of deterrent reasons. Um, but so in that sense, it has been a failure and a success for different reasons. I hope that helps. Sorry, sorry, that definitely helps. Thank you. Thank you very much for opening this. Um, Air Marshal, can I call you in now on, on this question? Of if you were king for one day, even two days. I'll give you two days, don't worry. You can take mm -hmm. one off. If that requires more, <laughs> what would you do? No, thanks. Can I just um, take 30 seconds to uh, maybe answer uh, yeah. the point Natasha made right at the end about the integrated reviews, strange almost schizophrenia over China. That reflects actually as a segue into the answer I'm gonna give you because the integrated review team would have gone a lot further, but felt they couldn't because the inertia of government departments especially Foreign Office and Treasury, who were very much behind the Osborne, Cameron, Golden Decade, the golden era of relations. And um, I can't say too much more, but if you'd read the papers, the first drafts of the integrated review before the sort of John Bue team came in, uh, you wouldn't recognise the final document uh, at all. I think one of them, it took for th you got to have page three on the China paper before it even mentioned something called the Chinese Communist Party. So um, what, what it is, is a fantastic demonstration of inertia in government. And that's, the, you know, your point about machinery government. So quickly, even as to Ammonia King for a day. Um, around government, the problem is the departments don't work very well together. And you saw in the pandemic after about, I mean, 10 days when things move quickly, by the second week, um, let's say technical proposals to use data better, um, went from we're going to make a decision tomorrow to two weeks later, there was oh, all 28 scientific advisors from each department now feel they ought to give this their approval. So what you have are quite jealously guarded silos, and yes, in some other areas as well, you have to get you know, con con consensus delivery. So the, the Department of Straight State Structure doesn't allow for some of the broader strategic questions. So yes, your National Security Council would have to be looked at, but also all the feeding elements to it. Um, and just one example, government's not very good at sharing data around even within some departments and over you know, misreadings of GDPR and Data Protection Act and all that sort of thing. So, you know, a proper cloud based government that had a proper data policy would be would be a great start. And finally, accountability, because accountability is never given to particular individuals, they can't turn around and use that accountability to demand actions from others. And I certainly know, you know, when um, a very, very senior civil servant recently in, in, in private remarks, um, thoughtful remarks, um, said if there was one thing that they could have got government to do decades ago across administrations and across party, it would have been a sort of national consensus on energy security. 
I think we can all see the benefit of you know that of, of that now. But government is not structured really to do that, and the electoral cycle means that the political class isn't really looking beyond five years either. So there are um, there are many many questions to answer here. But I would change those sort of three things: account, you know, accountability, putting people in charge of overarching strategic programs on that accountability and better data sharing um, across government. Within the Ministry of Defence, similar ones, um, I'd create a military strategic headquarters. At the moment, there isn't one. There's just a Department of State. It fudges some of the functions of a military strategic headquarters. But the military, as a going concern, as a fleet in being, is never really commanded collectively until a task force is created and that's handed over to PJHQ. And then that's used. Well, that's fine for crisis response, but it's not really good enough for what, what we're doing at the moment. Um, and then I would do a few other things as well around the way the Defence Board was structured to make sure that the, both the Department of State and the military strategic headquarters that fed from it were much more tightly gripped and fed from exactly the same strategic analysis. And if you got the first bit right, then mm. the Ministry of Defence would know exactly where it sat within the government's overarching long-term strategic objectives. Uh, I haven't got time to do it now. It's worth a seminar in its own. There are some good proposals within that. I was about to say, I mean, that's the seminar right there, because the mm. question that you raised about BGHQ links back to the point that you were making earlier in your own remarks on the question of what does it mean persistent engagement? If we are persistently engaged and therefore peacetime activities become operations, then PGHQ doesn't seem to be the ideal place where you want to run that. Is, is PGHQ a COCOM? Is, P, is Commander Joint Operations the global COCOM in American parlance? And can he be, given everything we said about war and warfare, means it has to be integrated across. And I don't think anybody in the UK government would allow us to go in the way that, say, COCOMs are in Africa, where mm. they you can argue in certain parts of the world, the, U the US government's approach is run through the combatant commander and state and treasury and others sort of come through that, that headquarters. That's not really the, you know, the British way in war, but it does mean that we need to look, look at command and control. And those are the sort of questions that the command paper ducked, I'm afraid. And I'm not going to agree with you, and I will hold you on this. So we'll have a seminar on this because it's an absolutely fascinating topic. And, and I couldn't agree more with you. This is one of the things that was sort of lost in the cracks and, you know, in the wings of, of, of the command paper. Um, Natasha, your thoughts? Um, yeah, um, I mean, I think your point about judging the partnership, the Russia-China partnership on our own metrics, if you like, or through you know, our own lenses, I think is certainly very true. Um, uh, I would say that um, in a way it's kind of useful, of course, for, for Russia in particular, I think, to, um, to have us sort of guessing and wondering about, you know, is, I mean, you know, the number of talks uh, that there have been in the last couple of years, you know, is there an alliance, is there not an alliance? You know, I mean, in a way it becomes, you just end up going around in circles really, um, I just I think it's slightly personally pointless um, exercise. Um, the point is that they've had a very strong relationship, whatever you want to call it, going back, uh, which started already in 1989, you know, because they had to have one in order to demarcate their joint border. And actually, there's been quite a big kind of institutionalization of the relationship through dint of the border demarcation, you know, having and also having to deal with all sorts of issues when they opened up the border, because obviously it was, you know, Vladivostok and so on, they were closed cities, you know, the border was completely closed before. And so then you had all of this uh, free trade and so on, uh, going back and forth across the joint border and lots of tensions in the 1990s around that border because of like Chinese, you know, criminality and so on and so forth. Uh, dealing with that you know so there have been lots of kind of more micro issues that they've actually had to deal with and that has meant that you know they've actually uh, and they have actually been able to deal with those um, challenges um, so it's a lot of the time it's more kind of smaller scale issues that they have actually been able to deal with as the, the relationship has matured you know we tend to only see these kind of big cheer political uh, things which of course are also going on um, you know, we've got to remember that Russia, China, they kind of need each other in some ways as well. In Central Asia, you know, again, there, you know, there's this idea of a division of labor and so on. Um, I don't think that they've necessarily sat down and created this division of labor. Um, you know, Russia has actually resisted Chinese economic uh, 
um, penetration in Central Asia. It's tried to, for example, in the SCO, China wanted to set up all these economic clubs and so on, energy clubs. Uh, Russia stopped China from doing that. Um, you know, but then, then of course, it's become kind of a moot point because China is now, you know, developing the BRI. Um, so, you know, R Russia can only do a certain amount really to kind of stop, um, you know, China, the Chinese economic locomotive, if you like. Um, but it'll be interesting when and if China needs to then protect its economic assets, if you like, in Central Asia. But I think another in interesting question about the partnership um, and certainly about, you know, how, for example, Central Asians um, perceive Russia as this kind of, you know, probably fear now and concern, um, you know, about Russia and the future kind of trajectory, if you like, of Russian power, you know, given what Russia has been doing in Ukraine. I mean, it can go either way, either, you know, there's a fear of Russian aggression, but then in the longer term, obviously, Russia could also be weakened. But at the same time, many of these Central Asian states depend on Russia, you know, economically, because there are a lot of Central Asian migrant workers. So actually, Russia and China are kind of bound together in various ways, economically and so on, um, in various ways that we don't necessarily sort of see on a kind of daily basis. So in a way, yes, they don't need to kind of formally say we have an alliance um, because there are already so many things that bind them together, I think. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is extremely um, helpful. And um, I have a question that um, a couple of questions here in, in, in the chat um, um, for all of you, actually, if anyone wants to take it. Um, one is a point that you all sort of refer to in different ways. And and um, and it goes back to the um, uh, sort of the minilateral um, uh, uh, proliferation, right, so on the back of uh, sort of the big organizations NATO, the EU, certainly we've seen during the uh, invasion of Ukraine, um, the beginning of, uh, even in Europe, of, of, of different type of formation. Um, Air Marshal Stringer mentioned Jeff, um, uh, there was reference done to AUKUS in the Indo-Pacific, uh, there was also the, the, the trilateral between the UK, Poland and, and, and Estonia. Um, how does this sort of proliferation of minilaterals and the suggestion of this, this more nimble approach to diplomacy that is, that is uh, uh, talked about um, in the integrated review fits within the broader picture of, of the stability of the international order and, and, and mobilizing partnership alliances? How do we integrate established patterns of interaction with partners and alliances and, and allies with other sort of uh, 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 formations that perhaps is not as just as structured, but still can be very useful in the face of a crisis. That's one bigger sort of question for anyone who wants to take it. The other question that sort of related to this um, is, if on the one hand we've seen minilaterals as the new sort of thing emerging from the last sort of year or so, and certainly it's been tested uh, during the uh, the war in Ukraine. Has the war in Ukraine, on the other hand, from a military point of view, turned the clock back to a more symmetric and traditional, um, if you want, uh, form of, of, of military challenge um, in contrast to what we've experienced in the last sort of quarter of a century? So two questions. How do millennials challenge the established patterns of interaction in political and diplomatic terms? And how the sort of war in Ukraine challenge this, this sort of direction of travel of, of warfare that, that we've experienced and we've accustomed to um, over the last sort of couple of decades. Anyone wants to sort of jump in? Yes, Air Marshal. Should I take the, 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 the second one first then? Because I think it's probably the more straightforward question. I like both questions, by the way. Um, but on, on, on the second one, I, I, I think the, the answer is probably no. Um, but then again, the premise behind the question ten, ten suggests that there was always some form of pure symmetric warfare, and, and I don't think there ever was. Um, I think we're all victims of the fact that most people's history comes from the narrative historians rather than military economists. So you know, the Battle of Jutland features heavily, but the blockade doesn't. But what what you know what was more important in bringing the first world first world war, first world war to an end? Uh, and yes, you know the uh, 
what you might call the Red Trouser Brigade were on manoeuvres um, in the first week in March, writing letters to Daily Telegraph saying, there you are, it's all about tank warfare. But actually just look what's happening with grain, the blockade of the Black Sea, gas prices, uh, all, the, all the other elements of war are continuing as, as well as the, you know, frankly, terrifying and terrible um, battlefield destruction that, that, that's going on uh, in eastern Donbass. And indeed, you know, the debate we've just had about Russia, China, is it a marriage of convenience? Is it an alliance as we would understand it? I would absolutely agree with everything Natasha said, by the way. My friends who've studied Russia, China will will say there were very good geo-economic reasons why they would find themselves working very, very, very closely together. So all these things are, are playing in and have played in and will continue, continue to play in. So I think the answer is symmetric warfare isn't, uh, isn't back. Oh, by the way, we discussed orbital, didn't we? We discussed several people, my, my more gifted panelists, talked about this war's been going on since 2014. All we've added is a bit of what looks like conventional symmetric battle of the bulgery going on in the, you know, in, in the Donbass. But uh, the asymmetric stuff is still there, um, will always be there, but always has been. Thank you. Anyone else who wants to sort of add to this, mm. particularly on the, yes, please. If so, I'll just, I'll just add, add to what's just been said, which is that I, I, I agree um, that, you know, I think th this is a, um, a little, um, almost like a little blip on a, on a much bigger scale as well. You know, we've got to think about Ukraine is an important crisis now, but it's not the only crisis happening. Um, we sometimes get distracted by, by that, that there are still a lot of asymmetric warfare going on in other places around the world that we are concerned about, first of all. And the second thing is that even if we're thinking about, um, you know, China as our, our, um, our kind of biggest long term threat, that China is less direct, less direct in its confrontation um then perhaps we might expect um russia to have been uh, obviously it does do indirect confrontation as well um and so i i think thinking about it in terms of turning the clock back to more traditional um state versus state warfare is 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 um is would be very risky very risky mm -hmm. I hear you. Um, um, Louise, thank you. Thank you both. Um, Natasha, do you want to, to add something to this? The um, multilateral element since, since... Yeah, you... I mean, the minilateral seems to be the flavour of, I don't know, the year or longer, I suppose. But, um, I mean, I guess um, it kind of does make sense and, you know, you can kind of bring the best expertise to the table, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. You know, obviously the danger is that then you kind of have these little sort of clubs um, you know, and and so I think, um, and then you know who is invited to 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 the club, you know, if you like, um, you know, and who's excluded, you know, it that could obviously be an issue along the way, um, but it probably is unavoidable in some senses, you know, given the kind of, you know, um, given the kind of um, huge scale, if you like, of you know some of these institutions um, and also given that some institutions like the United Nations, for example, um, some people might say is no longer fit for purpose. I mean, obviously it's only as good as its members, you know, so the UN sometimes works well and sometimes doesn't work well, um, you know, obviously, you know, due to the P5, the veto and so on. But on, on the other hand, you can argue, well, the General Assembly, you know, has, has begun um, to work quite well. Um, so, you know, my take on minilaterals is just, it, it's kind of arisen almost organically, and to me that seems to be probably a good thing rather than mm. a bad thing, but, but it could be, can be problematic, I think, um, in terms of how they then kind of actually interact with and cooperate with pre-existing um, organisations, yeah. Thank you. Um, I have to say that you guys are making my life very difficult to, to create a little bit of discontent and disagreement here. You're you all agreeing a little bit too much. But so I've got the last couple of questions. So so I'll try to, to, to make it work out some somehow. One is kind of like quick and it's directly related to a point that the Air Marshal Stringer raised earlier on. Um, 
your opinion, someone asking about the possibility of the UK using its own independent nuclear weapons outside the NATO context. Um, any comments on, 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 on this particular sort of aspect of the strategic dynamics, which in a way, it, it's also a fair question because the integrated re review did make it a point to reinvigorate the significance of the, uh, the nuclear arsenal um, and, and the strategic element um, of deterrence in this. Um, is there a value in, outside of the UK, outside the sort of the, 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 the NATO context? Yeah, go ahead. No, it's okay. for you. Uh, well, well, everyone's just thinking about it. Well, it, it does exist outside the NATO context. In fact, I think if you said to most people, to, uh, the nuclear deterrent, and you said, well, actually, it's, it's offered up to NATO, they mm. would be surprised. Mm. Um, uh, in fact, I spot I didn't get a chance to read it. There's a tweet today from a Euro think tank saying Europe needs its own nuclear deterrent. We've got two. Um, but the French one isn't offered up to NATO. Mm. But that, that, once again, has always been assumed to um, sort of add to the great ambiguity of what, you know, what response you'd, you'd, you'd get from the West. Um, the integrated review did take this much more seriously. And my, you know, my final thought for, for discussion, and uh, there's a, uh, I put a paper on the Policy Exchange website talking about this, Britain as a strangely reluctant nuclear power. Uh, because our deterrent is a thing the Navy does very well and has done very well since 1969 without missing a, so much as an hour of continuous at-sea deterrent. Mm. But for everyone else in the military, it might as well be a non-nuclear power. Mm. Um, and until I found this odd, as I ran the course that taught all our baby generals, um, I, I introduced this to the chiefs and they said, well, actually, you know, it's that, that's the elephant in the room. Because the Jeff, we've mentioned it already, mm -hmm. with a framework nation, you would expect a two-star British commander, we've got one. I think we're on the third iteration at the moment, Standing Joint Force Headquarters mm -hmm. Commander, uh, Major General Jim Morris. He mm -hmm. could be in charge of a 10-nation operation on the border in Estonia, let's say. And um, across, across is a commander, Russian commander, who has got a concept for using battlefield nuclear weapons. Mm. It's not to say that we should have some ourselves. It's to say, but our commanders have pretended, or we have pretended, and therefore our commanders have been educated to assume that the nuclear deterrent just takes the nuclear question off the table completely. And Ukraine has reminded us that, no, it's very much, very much back. Does it always have to be that way? Well, absolutely not. I mean, the French, they got rid of the land component, didn't they, a few years back now. But they mm. still have, uh, <laughs> forgive me, a two-pronged triad. Um, you know what I mean. Uh, and on the first day of their equivalent baby general course, their equivalent high command and staff course, they all go down to, the, I think it's the French nuclear test facility. And it's made absolutely clear to them as you are senior commanders of a nuclear military power. Mm. And then after that, they do the same sort of learning to steer a corps or a, or a division or a brigade, et cetera, et cetera. So I, th I think there will be a wake up call for the, for the UK. It won't be so much. A, we will rethink through the deterrent for the reasons that are in the IR, but I think we'll also rethink through the fact that we are in a nuclear world um, and we can't give ourselves a post-1989 buy any longer. Uh, wonderful. Um, thank you so much for that. And indeed, I can recommend more your paper uh, with Policy Exchange because I, I think it absolutely nails uh, this question and, and this, this discrepancy that is quite sort of clear about the fact that one is a nuclear power with a, with a permanent at-sea deterrent, but then most of the time the, the thinking assumes it's there, but doesn't really sort of articulate its implications, its advantages, challenges, and, and opportunities that it presents. Now, we're almost sort of coming to the end of this. Um, and, and perhaps one final quick word on, on the question of, of, of the Middle East and, and the Gulf region. And I'll perhaps ask Louise very quickly, um, to what extent what is happening in Ukraine, particularly from an energy security point of view, sort of raises question about the UK um, foreign policy and direction of travel, if you want, of its relationship in the Gulf states region. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, it's a good question. Uh, I mean, it's been interesting that the um, Middle East response has been very tepid, mm. <laughs> that actually uh, they've been noticeably quiet um, about saying too much about the Ukraine crisis. And, and that, that has been a little bit challenging, but also perhaps not surprising. Um, the, I, I, I don't think that it's 
it's necessarily changing any kind of relations um, with Britain. Uh, we've we've tried to convince the Saudis to um, help us out, and uh, they're fairly st sticking fairly strictly to their uh, modus operandi. Um, but I don't think it's going to have kind of any sort of long term impact and changing relations that already exist the only question has been whether it it has kind of forced some more pressure on the iranian nuclear negotiations mm. because of the lifting of sanctions following it and and mm. how that that might feed in but i you know i i don't think that while that might add an extra layer i think there's plenty of other layers before it gets to that one in terms of negotiations and, and, and complications. So it's, I, I don't think it's changing things fundamentally. And I don't think from a strategic perspective, it, it, any of this really changes the relationship with the Middle East. I mean, the Middle East was noticeably not very present in the integrated review at all. In, you know, mm. in fact, mm. um, uh, noticeably absent. And I think there is this kind of concern that if the Ukraine crisis continues, ongoing and also we're tilting to kind of to the Indo-Pacific and if something mm. happens over there we mustn't forget that the Middle East still exists and that there are likely to still be challenges there and think about what Britain's response might be in particular you know it seems very quiet following Abraham Accords and there's sort of new alliances or relationships being formed between different countries that's so making it seem like since US withdrawal from Afghanistan, that it's kind of forced a bit of more security uh, relationships to be formed across the region. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't think Britain, we should be lulled into any kind of false sense there. And, mm -hmm. and, and so we do need to kind of think about how that feeds into this bigger picture as well. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Natasha, I could see that yeah, you have your really, hand raised. Just really briefly, I wanted very to briefly. mention food security, because when we're talking about the Middle East, let's, and, you know, uh, Russia's been on a bit of a diplomatic offensive in the Middle East this week, they can, I mean, they can cultivate the discontent there um, and stoke the discontent there around the grain shortages and so on, you know, in a particular way. Wonderful. And you will be pleased to hear that 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 uh, in a couple of days time, there's a piece of mine um, addressing this specific question, food insecurity, the war in Ukraine and, and the maritime blockade. It, this is all linked, as you've all sort of showed in your conversation. Air Marshal, last word, literally the very last. No, uh, well, I, I'll, I'll say that someone else, it was to, it was to back up Natasha, it was to, to say, go and look at the map of those countries who are providing humanitarian aid to Ukraine, those providing military aid. And Point. it's a north-south split. And the, you know, the, we've got to, our diplomatic offensive must be much more channeled into that area that, that, that we're not concentrating on in the south, because they will look up, and I think our prime minister will have been told this in New Delhi recently, mm. they're going, another bloody war in Europe that you lot can't control yourselves and <laughs> we're paying for it with starvation and all the other bits and pieces and you know they have a point um, and indeed they, 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 they do and, and, and you know in, in this respect I think this, this conversation is ending exactly where we should have ended it in the sense that um, having addressed some of the broader sort of um, implications of the integrated review, how they've been sort of tested by recent events, but at the same time, lay the ground for the next conversation, but the one in which really sort of thinking outside the box and, and how to link the different dots, whether it is different theatres um, in the Pacific, Euro-Atlantic, uh, Middle East, whether it is about linking food and security um, to the blockade, to the war, um, to, to the diplomatic dimension, particularly on the question of diplomacy, British diplomacy and its reform. That's the topic that we will be addressing um, in, in the third uh, event related to, to these series. So all very good. I couldn't be happier. I couldn't be uh, more grateful to, to, to the panelists for, for, for sharing their time with us, their insights and enabling a conversation that has left some of the questions unanswered. But then we are almost full minutes past the ending time. So we really need to sort of like leave it there. But then it's good to leave people with something to be wished and wanting some more. So we've all done that job.
hopefully I did not um, I did not fail too much my chair duties. Again, I want to thank uh, Louise Kettle, uh, Air Marshal uh, Edward Stringer, and, and Natasha Kurt for joining us today um, in what has been an absolutely delightful discussion. Thank you very much, and I look forward to thank seeing you. everybody. Thank, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening.